Good morning, class. I am going to quickly go through this um, medicinal chemistry of non-insulin therapy of diabetes. And um, just to summarize this, just to summarize those uh, lecture objectives that we've already looked at in class, I want to briefly mention that, uh, or to add to it, um, I would like you to be able to look at a pharmacophore. and tell me which class of drugs, which receptor they bind to, okay? Um, at this point, the, the quiz should be posted and it, it will, I've given you 20 questions to help you look at material that will be important for the, for the exam, all right? So, Look at it for Marco for be able to tell me the class of the drug. Uh, it is important for you to know the, the activity of drugs in the same class based on differences in the structure. Uh, don't really focus on that on the exam, but it will be important in for therapeutics. For therapeutics. Um, and again, we're focusing mainly on structure, okay? Not so much, not so much on name memorization, but we're focusing on structure. All right. So let's jump into the lecture here. The first group of drugs that we'll deal with are the sulfonylureas. Now, sulfonylureas, as we mentioned in class, were discovered um, as a result of an effort to develop antibiotics. So. Sulfonamide antibiotics were being developed and were found to have a hypoglycemic effect. So it was actually a side effect. And so, in continuing with the investigation, uh, the sulfonamide antibiotics were modified with a urea moiety, which resulted in compounds with enhanced hypoglycemic effect. And these compounds are the sulfonylureas. So, these sulfonylurea work by stimulating the release of insulin from the pancreatic beta cells. And the site of action is a sulfonyl urea receptor one, sulfonyl urea receptor one. Now let's look at the structure activity relationship here. Um, there are two groups of sulfonyl ureas. There is the first generation and the second generation. Now the first generations are not particularly used in practice, but they are necessary to understand uh, how these class of drugs work. The first generation of sulfonylureas have small lipophilic substituents, right here. Small lipophilic substituents at the R1 position. And if you remember the structure of sulfonylureas, this is R1 position, this is the R2 position. So they have small lipophilic uh, substitution at the R1 position of the pharmacophore, and they have either an alkyl or a cyclic lipophilic substitution at the R2. So see here, this is alkyl chain, alkyl chain. Again, you have an alkyl chain. You have a cyclic uh, lipophilic. Substituent here, cyclic lipophilic here again. All right, so these are the characteristics of uh, the first generations. As a general rule, these um, you you had to use uh, high dose, um, and some of them, such as clopropamide, had a long, long. They stayed long in the body. Okay. All right. Now the newer ones, the second generation of sulfonylureas, are um, they're, they're a bit different. So on the R1 group, they have a para beta aryl carboxy amido ethyl group. Okay. So this is the R1 side here. They have a para. Um, they have a a para, a para position here, a, a beta aryl, this is the aryl group, 
um, carboxy amido right here carboxy amido ethyl ethyl group okay so the biggest difference biggest structural difference is this group here you also see it here and you have a modification of the group here so instead of the instead of the uh, the the L group you have a uh, substituted L group here and then in this case you have a five membered ring but those play this a similar role those are basically um, bioisosters bioisosters Azosteres. So this is a bioazosteric replacement, and it gives you the same uh, same type of activity. What it does is um, to to the second generation is they have increased potency, they have rapid onset, they have shorter plasma half lives and longer duration of action due to the strong binding uh, to their receptor. Okay, and this is due to the presence of the para beta arrel carboxy amido ethyl group on the R1 position. Similarly to the uh, first generation, they still have uh, the cyclic lipophilic substituent, okay, at the R2 position. So, take away from this slide here, the biggest di difference between first and second generation is the presence of the uh, para beta aryl carboxy amido ethyl group at the R1 position. Now, the sulfonylureas are highly um, protein bound to albumin and the metabolism occurs in the liver and there is created through the kidneys. Glyburide and glipizide are metabolized via hydroxylation of the cyclohexyl ring followed by um, hemide hydrolysis of the R1 group and then that's going to lead then to acetylation. Glimepiride is metabolized by CYP2C9 sequentially of the cyclohexyl ring. Um, the methyl group is going to be metabolized to, a, to an alcohol and that's active and then to an acid that is inactive. Okay. On the exam I do not focus on the um, on the metabolism of, of glipeparide and glipizide, but it's good for you to have that information available. All right, meglitinides, uh, meglitinides, you will not see them on the exam at all. Um, they are mentioned here for the sake of completion. So, these compounds were synthesized by replacing the non sulfonylurea portion of second generation sulfonylureas um, with carboxylic acid. And then they were further modified to obtain the current structures. Okay. Um, similarly to the sulfonylurea, they stimulate the release of insulin from the pancreas. And um, they. Um, the receptor that they affect is a sulfonylurea receptor. Now there's there's different types of sulfonylurea receptor. Uh, Nitroglinide specifically uh, affects the sulfonylurea receptor one, um, but there are other receptors that they can affect, and we'll see that in the in the coming slides here. Now, as I mentioned, as I mentioned. Uh, there are different kind of sulfonylurea receptors, 1, uh, 2A and 2B, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, those receptors are on the pancreatic beta cell, but you can also find them on cardiac and small muscle cells. Uh, Ripoglinide actually binds to the sulfonylurea receptor on the beta cells, but also on the cardiac and the small muscle, so it leads to more extra pancreatic side effect. Now, the glenide, uh, however, is more specific. It binds specifically to the sulfonylurea receptor 1. So these are the two um, that are that have been synthesized and, 
and I've been released. Um, the role in in therapy is not as important as sulfonylurea, so I will not really focus too much on them. I want you to be able to know the structure. I want you to be able to know that they are um, they affect the sulfonylurea receptor one, and that there are modifications from the sulfonylurea structure. All right, metformin and its class of drugs. Um, so they're called by guanides and uh, and historically they came from a plant called galogen 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 is what you call the lead compound lead compound that's the compound that had activity and then was modified to obtain metformin so galogen is a naturally occurring compound uh, from galegia officinalis and um, by guanides are chemically represented by the linkage of guanidine groups. The role is to reduce hepatic glucose production, okay, decrease intestinal glucose absorption, and increase insulin sensitivity. The only one that's available on the market is metformin. I am listing the others um, so that you understand the trend in the structure activity relationship. All right, so here's metformin here. Uh, here's buformin. Buformin is basically the butyl analog of metformin. Um, and fenformin is the phenyl analog of, um, of metformin. So these drugs are formed by linking two guanidine groups. You have two guanidine groups linked together, and that gives you the metformin. Uh, the, on, the, the reason why metformin is the only one available is because the other derivatives have been discontinued due to potential uh, toxic laxic acidosis, okay? And that leads to a result um, as a result of decreased gluconeogenesis. So that leads to, um, there's also been instances of, of cardiac uh, toxicity. And so those two Buformin and fenformin have been disconnected. Uh, as medicinal chemists, I would like you to know the structures uh, and to be able to, to know that they have been disconnected. There have been, uh, um, there, there have been um, discontinued, discontinued, not disconnected. All right, so metformin is not protein bound and it's not metabolized. So it's a bit of a boring drug when it comes to metabolism. Um, but it's, the structure is very interesting. Uh, basically, be able to know that um, it comes from galogen. Galogen. And galogen was a natural product. All right. Um, it's very much used today. Metformin is very much used today in the treatment of diabetes. And you will learn that in the therapeutic section of the class. All right, still running through here. Um, so these are called paroxysm proliferator activated receptor agonists. Um, usually they will be called gladisones because most of them have at the end of the name um, that gladisone sound. And so one of the ways they're commonly referred to are the gladisone. Now this is the pharmacophore of the gladisone. It's um, it's a, it's a thiazolidinedione, thiazolidinedione moiety. Okay, thiazolidinedione moiety. Now these, these glitazones uh, work by uh, increasing the sensitivity of muscle cells to insulin, and also by increasing glucose transporter expression. Okay, so there are insulin sensitizers. Insulin sensitizers. Two structures that are here, uh, pyoglitazone and rosiglitazone. Okay, now when you look at this here, you can see that there are, there's different parts. There is this part and there is this part, I call that two, and there is this part, which I call three. Okay, this part is the polar head of the molecule. 
polar head of the molecule. Okay, so that's the thiazolidin dione polar head. And it's hydrophilic. Okay, now this is the um, linker. This is the linker. Sorry for the misspelling here. Uh, it's the arrow uh, linker or spacer. And then this will be the hydrophobic head of the molecule. I would like you to be able to look at this on an exam and um, and be able to answer that question if I ask you to uh, identify which part of the glitazone is which you should be able to know that this is the hydrophilic head this is the linker and this is the hydrophobic head okay and you can do the same so on this side here this is a hydrophilic Hydrophilic because that's where you have the thiazolidin dione. This is the linker, okay, and this is the hydrophobic, hydrophobic portion. Again, the pharmacophore is the thiazolidin dione. Um, for activity, the R must be para substituted. Let me take that back. For activity, uh, there must be an R group. Let, let's just take a look at the at the phenyl groups here. So, if we called uh, these groups R groups, the, the R groups or the substituents around the phenyl ring have to be in the para position. Okay? So, if this is R1, this is R2, those two have to be in the para position to each other. Okay, I hope this makes sense. So those two relative to each other have to be in the para position. So if you had to, if there was a structure with, let's say this structure here, this linker was moved to this position, even though you will still have the hydrophobic, you have the linker and the hydrophilic head, this one will not work. Let's say you had a substituent at this position, you move this substituent here, this new molecule will not work because it wouldn't be para position. Okay, so um, I hope this helps you guys. So, so if this is the phenyl ring, okay, if this is the phenyl ring. Uh, we need to have para substituents in order for that to work. These molecules are highly protein bound to albumin. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. Somebody asked me in class whether it was glycosidase or glucosidase. It is actually alpha-glucosidase. So the title is right. I got carried away when I was typing it. Um, so the title is right. These are alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. Okay. All right. So quickly, alpha-amylase and alpha-glucosidase are enzymes that are involved in, in carbohydrate metabolism. So what the alpha-amylase does, it, it breaks down the complex polysaccharides into oligo and disaccharides okay and then um, alpha glucosidase takes over from there and is, is then going to break the disaccharide into glucose uh, some of the alpha glucosidase that we have are maltase um, sucrase isomaltase um, and so on and so forth now because alpha glucosidase convert uh, disaccharides into glucose, if you were to block alpha glucosidase, what you will do is you will prevent conversion of disaccharides to glucose, which will lead to delay of the absorption of glucose. Okay, so these disaccharides then um, are going to go to go lower in the GI tract because they're not able to be broken down. They go low in the GI tract, further down into the colon. And you end up with a bunch of sugar further down in the colon 
which is what's going to lead to the side effects of flatulence and GI discomfort. Okay. Now here are the examples of the alpha glucosidase inhibitors, um, acarbose, voglibose, miglitol. They're basically poly, poly, uh, high hydroxy, uh, poly hydroxy containing groups. They're sugars. All right, so you have all these hydroxy groups here. Same here. And then you have all these hydroxy groups here. All right, so alpha glucosidase inhibitors are going to mimic the natural disaccharide substrates by containing polyhydroxy groups. Um, Archibalds is actually uh, isolated from Actinomyces otahensis. And so they block the absorption of the sugar. They prevent it from being metabolized. And then it ends up in the column. So that's the mechanism of action of, of that. Um, let me see if there's anything else I want you to know from these. Yep, that's the, that's the, main, that's the main idea here. All right, so just a word on the metabolism of uh, of acarbose. So, uh, intestinal bacteria are going to break that down, and you will end up with this here. That's going to be glucuronidated sulfated and then be excreted okay now this metabolite here is actually going to be still active so this metabolite here is going to be still active um, and um, continue the activity of the drug in the system all right glp1 agonist glp1 agonist i mentioned in class that when two equivalent of, of glucose are taken up one by mouth and one by IV, you have a higher insulin response with the oral dose compared to the IV dose. And that's due to what we call the incretin effect. Okay, There, there are two incretin hormones that are responsible for this effect. There is GLP-1 and GIP. GLP stands for glucagon-like protein. Uh, GIP is a gastric inhibitory polypeptide. Okay, Here we're focusing on GLP-1 only. GLP-1 is a 36 amino acid polypeptide. It is secreted by the L cells of the gut uh, in response to a meal. Then GLP-1 is going to act on pancreatic beta cells to cause insulin to be released in the short term, but it's also going to lead to insulin synthesis in the long term. All right. Um, so... GLP has a very, very, very short half-life. GLP-1, the, the, the one that's synthesized by the body, has a very, very short half-life, one to two minutes, because it's going to be cleaved by an aminopeptidase enzyme called dipeptidylpeptidase 4. We summarize, or we abbreviated DPP-4. Okay? So one of the ways to... Um, so let's think about it. GLP-1, GLP-1, causes increase um, insulin okay so it's a good thing for um, it's a good thing um, it, it helps with increasing insulin as a response to a meal the problem is GLP-1 is only in the body for one to two minutes one to two minutes because DPP4 are going to cleave it. Okay, DPP4 is going to come and cleave it. So there's two things that we need to do. The first thing is, first possible thing, is make GLP1 resistant to DPP4. Okay? So it can act longer. Second thing is 
we can inactivate or block the PP force and both of these will result in increasing insulin secretion so let's see uh, both strategies at work here one of the strategies is to synthesize GLP-1 analogs or to discover GLP-1 analogs um, since DPP-4 is going to cleave GLP-1 at the alanine uh, if you look at GLP-1 the active form here DPP-4 is going to cleave right here at this alanine is going to cause the release of these two amino acids and then this is going to be an inactive peptide what the first strategy that scientists used was basically substituting the alanine with other amino acids like threonine and glycine and alpha aminobutyric acid these analogs actually had an extended in vitro I want you to remember that in vitro half-life okay so substituting the alanine with threonine and glycine gave an extended in vitro half-life but not in vivo not in vivo why not not in vivo because even though they had extended in vitro half-life as soon as they were put in the body they were eliminated by the kidneys and their half-life was only two to four minutes you know you go from one to two to two to four minutes that's that's an increase but not significant enough so if, if another challenge then will have to be to develop dpp4 um will have to be to develop not only dpp4 resistant uh, um, compounds but these compounds also will have to have delayed uh, kidney elimination all right so exenide uh was discovered from the gut of the gila monster and in that drug basically glycine replaces alanine and then in the rest of the glp you have 58 percent homology to the human glp so it is both resistant to dpp4 dpp4 and it is has delayed uh, elimination it gives the drug a three hour half-life three hour half-life I believe there is a question on the quiz where you are asked specifically about this here all right the other drug I want to mention here is liraglutide it's also a GLP-1 analog uh, It's developed from a series of acetylated GLP-1 analogs It's going to be resistant to DPP-4. It's also ha going to have decreased kidney elimination because it binds to albumin. Okay. Um, there's always a chance of immune reaction with these compounds because obviously they're they're biological compounds taken um, and and sorry, injected in the human body. So there's always a a possibility of immune reaction. All right. So this is a structure of um, it's a structure of uh, liraglutide, and as I mentioned, you have the acetylated compounds here. Okay, so we said that one of the options to increase GLP-1 activity or effect was to get some GLP-1s that were resistant to DPP-4. The other option is to make DPP-4 inhibitors, okay? So let's talk a little more about what DPP-4s exactly are. So DPP-4 are serine proteases. They exist either as membrane-bound or as plasma-soluble. Um, and there are many isoforms, okay? There's four, five, six, so on and so forth. Now the one that we are targeting are the DPP-4s, okay? So the inhibitors have to be somewhat specific to that DPP-4. Um, so that we don't stop other processes in in the body. These are the DPP-4s that have been synthesized and um, 
and I will go through the structure activity relationship of those um, just off of memory um, sexagliptin, cetagliptin, linagliptin and alogliptin I believe are the ones that are available on the US market I don't believe vildagliptin is available I do know that um, on the Indian market it's available I believe but as a medicinal chemist uh, I'm 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 bringing those structures up so that you can understand um, the structure activity relationship and the therapeutics part of the class will help you know which one you actually use in practice all right so let's work through these here so three of the analogs that I mentioned to you three of the inhibitors saxagliptin, vildagliptin and alogliptin contain a cyano group okay saxagliptin, vildagliptin and alogliptin all contain a cyano group that that cyano group is likely to form a reversible covalent immediate adult with the serine 630 and that's going to cause the activation of DPP4. All right. Saxagliptin and vildagliptin contain an alpha amino acyl pyrrolidine group. So let's find saxagliptin here. And vildagliptin. They have an alpha amino acyl. Alpha amino acyl pyrrolidine group. All right, so this is the uh, alpha amino acylpyrrolidine group. Alpha amino acylpyrrolidine group. Right, right here. Alpha amino acylpyrrolidine group. I don't question. I don't have a question on that on the exam. Um, Um, but I provide the pharmacophores here for you guys okay so so you have that here and you have that here okay um, cetagliptin has a pip resin ring that's fused to a parazole so let's find uh, cetagliptin this is cetagliptin it has a pip resin ring that's found that's fused with a parazole okay but it still has the alpha amino ethyl um, it still has the alpha amino ethyl moiety in, included in it um, and it still has the amide bond as well still has the amide bond as well okay Linagliptin contains a xanthin ring. So this is xanthin here. Here's linagliptin. Linagliptin contains a xanthin ring. As a central pharmacophore. Okay. Now the xanthin has a C, has a C8 This is carbon 8 here. The xanthin has a C8 amino piperidin and in N7, this is N7 here, so you have C8 here, amino piperidin, and then you have a N7 uh, butanol substituent, and those are going to help with binding to the DPP4 enzyme. The C8 amino piperidin primary I mean is going to occupy the recognition site so the C8 is going to occupy the recognition site and is going to form hydrogen bonds with with these amino acids here okay glutamic acid glutamic acid tyrosine by pi stacking so tyrosine 547 um, is going to be held in place by pi stacking 
with aromatic interactions or the fennel of the tower is in 547 okay um, the N7 butanyl substituent N7 is going to occupy a hydrophobic pocket the C6 C6 okay C6 carbo carbonyl hydrogen bonds with the backbone of NH of tyrosine 631 so you have C6 is going to hydrogen bond this here is going to hydrogen bond so the C6 is the carbon the oxygen that's on it has some electrons this oxygen is going to engage in hydrogen bonding interaction with the amine of tyrosine 631 all right the quinazoline ring is going to arrive by pi stacking interaction so this is a quinazoline ring is going to interrupt by pi stacking interaction with tryptophan 629 now let's deal with alogliptin alogliptin um, has a 2 4 pyrimidine dion pharmacophore so this is a pyrimidine dion here fancy name for uracil Okay, and alogliptin has a 2,4 pyrimidine dione from aqua 4. And it has the essential basic amino, um, it has a, an amino acid structure. So it, it basically has a essential basic amino acid group on the piperidine ring and a cyano group. Okay, so you have that. cyano group here and then on this here on this is a piperidine green ring this is where you have the essential amino group all right so that essential amino group is the one that's most likely to bind to the active site serine now when you look at this um, when you look at this mechanism here you have the serine protease is, is attacking here at this position causing a the formation of a covalent bond in order for that to happen you need you need that essential if I take you back here you're gonna need that essential group here. Okay, that cyano group is going is it needs to be present. So let me take you back here. This is the cyano group here. So this cyano group is essential. So you have the cyano group in saxagliptin. You have the cyano group in alogliptin. You also have the cyano group. Um, in Vildagliptin here. This is essential for that interaction. All right, amylin agonists. Um, let's go quickly through those. So amylin is a hormone that consists of a single chain of 37 amino acids. It is secreted by the beta cells. The hormone is actually co-secreted with insulin. Um, It is often deficient in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but the hormone itself cannot be directly injected because it, it, it's insoluble and it aggregates. So um, the goal of the medicinal chemistry is to find analogs that are going to be, um, to have enough solubility uh, so that we can administer them as drugs. Promlintide uh, is an amylin analog its water solubility has been increased by replacing alanine, serine, and serine-29 with prolines. And the drug is administered subcutaneously. 
speaks at about 20 minutes. As a medicinal chemist, the only thing I'm really concerned about here is the fact that we have replaced all these amino acids here with prolines. Okay, that's the only thing I'm concerned about. SGL2 um, inhibitors, SGL2 inhibitors. Um, so, this is a pharmacophore for the SGL2 inhibitors. It is basically a it's basically a natural compound, natural compound um, that has been found to to bind to to the SGL2 transporter. The SGL2 transporter is a transporter that helps to reabsorb glucose from the urine. So instead of urine going in, in the instead of glucose going in the urine, that glucose is reabsorbed by the SGL2 co-transporter. So if you block those co-transporters, then you have the urine uh, glucose being eliminated in the urine. So SGL2 inhibitors work by inhibiting the sodium glucose transport protein found in the kidney and is responsible for reabsorbing the majority uh, filter glucose from the renal proximal tubules, okay? So that sodium glucose transporter is the protein that is responsible for reabsorbing the majority of filter glucose. So we block it, the majority of glucose is not reabsorbed, goes in the urine. So the SGLT2 um, is a transmembrane protein. It has 672 amino acids. Um, the channel has 14 transmembrane alpha helices. And um, fluorescein and glucose basically bind to the same amino acids. Okay, threonine 156 and lysine 157 in uh, transmembrane protein 4. And when, when, when fluorescein binds there because it competes with glucose, it can reduce the amount of glucose being reabsorbed. So, compounds such as canagliflozin, um, Farziga, and Jardians have been synthesized with fluorescein in mind. The difference between them and fluorescein is the fact that we've actually removed, if you look at here, we have removed the, we have removed the oxygen here. We've removed this oxygen here. Okay, so if I want to break down this molecule, I'll say that this is the a glycone part. A glycone part, basically the, the part that's not a sugar, not a sugar. Okay, um, you have rem the this is the there's an oxygen here. This is the glycone part here. When you look at the analogs that were synthesized, those analogs do not have um, do not have an oxygen between the a glycone and the glycone part. Okay, so both the glycone of the sugar part and the a glycone part are important for activity. You can't have one without the other. They're both important for activity. Um, if you have a compound that has a glycone part, let me let me try and draw that for you. Let's say you have a compound that has sugars but then is bound to the a glycone part with an oxygen. This is easily cleaved. This is easily cleaved. And so this drug is not going to be a good candidate. If you only have a compound with the sugar part, OK, 
Okay. This will have no activity. No activity. Because you need both the sugar portion and a glycone portion. If you only synthesize a compound of the glycone portion and no sugars, it will have no activity. Again, for these compounds to have activity, you need the sugar portion, you need the glycone portion, and you need no oxygen between the two. Because if they are linked with a oxygen containing linker, that oxygen containing linker can easily be cleaved and that inhibitor will not be optimal I've spent a lot of time on this slide because I believe there is a there's a question on the exam about that all right so let's go through here the pharmacophore and uh, the structural activity relationship so again the pharmacophore is a is a beta D uh, glucoside Fluorescein is a beta D glucoside. It was first isolated from the bark of the apple tree. It consists of a glucose moiety linked to two phenyl rings, which we call the glycon part, through an alkyl spencer. Okay. Glycosides are metabolically unstable because they're going to be hydrolyzed uh, in the GI by glucosidases. So there are poor drug candidates. So these are these are glycosides. Poor drug candidates. Okay. Now the drugs that are on the market, they replace the O glycoside with a C glycoside. So instead of a O glycoside, you just have a C glycoside, which is going to confer metabolic stability as well as significant selectivity for SGLT2 over SGLT1. Okay, In the case of canagliflozin, the alkyl spacer is actually replaced by a thionyl moiety. So instead of simply having an alkyl spacer, there is a thionyl moiety here that's going to link the two phenyl rings. For the other two, they are C glycosides with a methylene alkyl spacer. So there's C glycoside here. Okay, C glycoside, you have a methylene alkyl spacer. Methylene alkyl spacer here. Canagliflozacin is the only one that has a thionyl group. Thionyl group. All right. I believe this concludes our lecture. Uh, take time, go through it, email me your questions, and uh, I'll be happy to to answer those.